thousand percent for you guys, and I am very, very excited. So let me. All right. So my name is Levo Valencia. I am an educator in New York. I am officially licensed to teach um, secondary mathematics. So I teach at a high school. I also teach at two different colleges. I teach at Lehman College and uh, Mercy College. And I am very passionate about uh, mathematics, making it fun. I am an author. My book, Math Play, came out this year, earlier this year, like in, in, in July. I have a website, legalvalencia.com. And I am pretty active on Twitter. You could find me at, at Mr. Valencia. 24. So uh, in addition to being a, a, a mathematics educator and being very passionate about it, I've been teaching for the past 16 years. Um, and I'm, I love it. I love every minute of it. I, I feel like my heart is in the classroom. Uh, but in addition to like being a, a educator, my main job is being a dad. I have a two, uh, two little girls at home. I have an eight year old uh, and I have a four year old. My eight year old is extremely well behaved. If you have like more than one kid, you know what I'm talking about. The little one does whatever she wants. The little one listens to nobody, does whatever she wants. So today we are going to talk about math play. So let's get let's get started. So before we get started, I actually wanted to start as an educator. I, I wanted to thank you for being here today. Um, I think that it takes an educator to know the struggle, right? To know the struggle of educators. So you are giving up time on a Sunday where you could be doing anything else, like getting ready for Thanksgiving, getting ready for the week, uh, if you're if you're in the States. Um, but like you are here. My goal today is I have attended some amazing presentations already. So my goal is to give you some tools, give you some ideas that you could implement as early as tomorrow. Like you want to bring them back to your students and then get started. And I am very thankful that you're here because I feel that you're here for your students, right? You want to pick up ideas that will ultimately benefit your students. All right. So let's, with that said, let's get started and let's, let's see what we have. So I want you to take a couple of seconds. I don't know, like five seconds. Yeah, five seconds. And I want you to, on the chat, tell me what is, what, regardless of the grade level that you teach, what's one thing young children love to do. And let's do sort of like a chat explosion. So we'll do it in five, four, three, two, one, and go. What is one thing that young children love to do? Copy of those video games. Yes. Play, play. Well, you are attending uh, facilitating math play. So most, oh, talk. Yes. Run, explore, pretend. You, oh, my God. Be creative. Sleep, talk, create. Yes. So my having two little ones at home. Uh, I feel that like the number one thing that young children love to do, is, oh, ask questions for sure, is play. So it feels to me as a parent that they have an unlimited, unlimited uh, supply of energy to play. Any time of the day is a good time to play. Any day of the week is a good day to play. So it always feels that children have unlimited like time and energy to play. So the whole idea of math play for me Start even though I teach a uh, secondary like high school and college, the whole idea of math play for me started with my daughter, my older daughter at home. So I now want you to take a look at this picture. Take a look at this picture and tell me like one thing, and we can use the chat, one thing that comes to mind. As you look at this picture, take a few seconds to see what's happening. What do you like? What do you notice here? What do you wonder? But like I want you to share one thing that comes to mind. And I'm going to be, look, be looking at the chat. So what is, it's a growing pattern, growing size, pattern, growing pattern, building equivalence, symmetry, matching. Yes, symmetry, all hexagons. Yes, Dustin, uh, red hexagon. We have a bunch of hexagons going on in here. One, two, two, three, six. Oh, what do the numbers tell you? Bright colors, growing hexagons. All right, so let me tell you a little bit of like what is happening on this picture. So this is a this is a math play activity with my daughter at home. So one day we were in our basement and we started. We have all kinds of toys in our basement, aka uh, uh, math play headquarters. So we started building hexagons, right? Like you know, nothing too crazy. We started building hexagons. But then the thing that I wanted my daughter to think about is that, all right, let's try to make hexagons, but let's use like the same number of shapes. What do I mean by that? So if you look at the first one, we have one hexagon. And then here we kind of have like two triangles and two uh, rhombi, right? 
So we got two of two. And then on the next one, we were still able to create a bigger hexagon now using two trapezoids, two hexagons, two triangles, and two rhombi. So things like this. This is how Mathly started for me. As a, as a mathematics educator, I couldn't wait to like teach my daughter mathematics, even though I had no training or, or, or license to teach elementary um, grade levels. I wanted to like play with my daughter and teach her and whatnot. So the whole idea of math play for me started with my daughter at home. So back when she was in um, like pre-K or kindergarten, when she was like very young, we started doing like operations, like different quantities, like different numbers. We are big fans of Dan Finkel. So we got um, his, um, the, the card game, the, the card that, that he has. And we started like doing different representations of numbers. So for example, we will say like, I will say, Mariana, what's, what number is this? So she will say, oh, six. And like, how, how else can we represent six? So then she will like try different things. We also started using different uh, manipulators that we have at home, like dominoes and dice to start playing with like addition and subtraction. So she will say something like, all right, Mariana, well, how can we get to nine? So she will give me like four and five. And I say like, is there another way? So this was always fun. And it was it was fun for me to see that she was always engaged. And even like when she hadn't learned some of these things in the context of like, like kindergarten we were like still playing with it at home because it was we made it like we made it um very accessible for her to play with the things another um math play activity that we did a lot was like playing with different shapes so not only patterns but when she was younger we would just we would just start exploring different shapes like uh like you know the triangle the square the rectangle and one thing that i would that i love doing with her was having her create the, her own like anchor chart now as a secondary teacher to be honest anchor charts were like completely new to me i thought that like i've never used them with my with my students at the high school but i started using them with my daughter so what i had her do is like we will create an anchor chart and i will say it to her mariana i want you to write down anything that you know about the rectangle so she put the little rectangle in the middle she wrote her name you can see her handwriting and then she will say like, okay like this uh dice i'm gonna put it 40 because he has like four sides it has four corners this is what it will look like in three dimensions because we have the 3d shapes and then she used like different dominoes to show me like how to get to four now on the on the left side that section was blank and she was telling me, uh, Dad, what do I what do you think I should put in there? And I said, you know what? You decide. I didn't tell her what to do. I said, like, you decide what should go in there. And then, like, you know, she was thinking for a little bit. And then she was like, oh, Tata, look, check it out. This is what I came up with. So then I come over to check, and she had put a, a whole section of like the rectangles best friends, which like isn't is not a mathematical thing, right? It's not like like shapes have friends, but if they did have friends, like what would be the friends of the rectangle? She put a little square, she put the little rhombus, she put a little diamond. So I was very pleased. We also have a bunch of like little whiteboards in our house. So even though she was young and like she hadn't seen like Venn diagrams, we started kind of like playing with that. I, we did a circle and I said, Mariana, I want you to put in this like circle, all the shapes that have four sides. So she did that. Then we erased that circle, did a new circle, and then I said, I want you to put in this uh, on this circle all the shapes that have equal sides. So she did that. And then we kind of like overlapped them together. And then I said, all right, now let's organize all the shapes. And then she's like, what do we put in the middle? And then we said, oh, in the middle, we should have like the ones that had both four sides and equal sides. So it was just like a fun exploration, playing with like different operations, playing with different shapes. So here's another example um oh this one was a really really good one so one day i'm playing with her we're in the basement and we're like creating different shapes right in two dimensions so we're like playing with the set she's like creating a little car she's creating a little house and then she asked me tata can we like use this same shapes to create it like with the with our building blocks and i said well let's try it and then like we started trying the first one that we did was the car and it like it worked out and it was very nice now I took, I'm sharing two pictures of, of things that actually work, but in reality, there were many things that we tried, like she tried to build and they wouldn't work. Now, as in like, as an educator and her dad, she will ask me, Tata, is this going to work? And I knew in my heart that it wasn't going to work uh, because it wasn't going to be stable, but I didn't share that with her. I will say something like, hmm, I don't know. I'm not sure, but let's try. Let's try it together. I wanted my daughter to feel that it's okay not to know. It's okay to make mistakes and it's a hundred percent okay to just explore and have fun and let, let's see if it works. Let's see if it doesn't work at the beginning, like full disclosure. Sometimes she will get upset or she will be like, Oh my God, like, 
this is not working. Can you just help me? And we will kind of like work together because I do like we to always talk about like having a growth mindset. But I wanted to like model it for her. Like, I don't know. I mean, I did know, but I pretended that I didn't know so that we could explore together. So this was definitely a winner, creating something in two dimensions and then try to translate it to three dimensions. Oh, this is the most, uh, a more recent one. One day we were watching one of the Marvel movies and then like they mentioned the Mayan culture. And then like I, I said, like we're, we're, I'm from, I was born and raised in Colombia. So I, I told Miranda, oh yeah, the Mayans, they were back in Colombia in the, like, that area. And then she said to him, and I share, oh, they had their own number system. And then she's like, what do you mean they had their own number system? So then I took a picture that we went on Google and I showed her, oh, this is what the Mayan number system looked like. And then I said, why don't we try to create it together? So we started using like Jenga pieces and like some of the circles that we had to create or like to like show her what the Maya number system looked like. Now, my goal as her dad, as her teacher, was to have her like go up to 100. But I think this is the last one that she created. I think she went up to, I'm going to move this, up to like 68. And I was happy. I was pleased because she understood the relation and she understood like different versions, right, of numbers and different representations. Um, so that was a lot of fun to see. And a lot of times, like the activities that we do or like the math, math play explorations that we end up doing is usually like a question that she has. And then she's like, all right, like, what does that look like? And then like, I usually pretend that I'm like, I don't know, Marianne, I don't know what that looks like. Let's see. Let's try to find out together. So this was an activity that was fun. This one, I got to tell you about this one. One day, as I mentioned, I teach um, high school mathematics. So usually I teach like geometry, like pre-calculus, calculus. One day I'm working on my computer. I'm making a lesson for my for one of my pre-cal classes. So Mariana walks behind me. She looks at the screen and she says, what's a function? So then I have to stop. So I stop and I say, hmm, all right. So now my teacher brain is thinking, how do I explain a function to my daughter who is like in second grade? Like in, the, in a context, um, a framework that she can really understand. So I told her, well, a function it's like a fun rule. It's like a fun instruction that you do. And she was like, what do you mean by that? So then at that point, I had to stop my lesson, stop building the lesson. I went and got the whiteboards and then we started like building like fun functions. So I said, all right, let's consider the triangle. Let's do a function for the little triangle. That's the upper right. And then what we ended up doing was creating like a bigger triangle using little triangles. So I told Mariana, look, we, we start with the triangle. We're going to create, we're going to use four more triangles to create a bigger triangle. And then I had her like try it. I said, all right, so that is the fun function. That is the fun rule. I'm going to give you a shape and I want you to recreate that shape. Bigger. And she said, oh, I can try that. So then we went into the square and like that was easy. It was just, oh, this is easy. I'm going to put four squares and now I have a bigger square. Then I gave her a trapezoid. She struggled. It wasn't working, but we stayed with it until the point that she was able to make it. And she was like extremely happy. She was showing mom that she was able to do a bigger trapezoid. Also, I took pictures of the ones that work. But for example, we was a lot of time trying to do the hexagon, which doesn't work. Like you couldn't do it. We couldn't make a hexagon um, built using hexagon pieces. And it was fun. So a lot of times I feel that, you know, we teach mathematics like this, like this is first grade. This is second grade. This is third grade. Here I was showing her a concept that I teach at the high school to my second grader in the context of math play, right? We weren't really learning, but we were doing exploration. And at, at which point, at whatever point she sees this at the in her school, she's gonna be familiar with it. And it was it was just fun. Um, we not only use different, like all the different like play sets and manipulators that we have in our house. But we also tend to use like different um, tech tools, right? My, my daughter has an iPad and I put like all different kinds of uh, tools in there. Here's some examples. Like you, we use applets from GeoGebra. We use them. We're big fans of the Math Learning Center. A lot of times what I have her do or what, what we used to do is she will build something with her playset and then we will try to recreate it with the applets of the Math Learning Center. And sometimes we will start with the Math Learning Center, build something there, and then I'll say, all right, Miranda, now use that and let's translate it to our regular shapes. So this, what I've noticed with my daughter is that she was, she's always like engaged. She's always, she always wants to like try it out. I, I try to model a lot of like the growth mindset where I always pretend that I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and, and we kind of like find out together. Now, before we go into like the fun stuff of, of uh, secondary level, I, I need to share this story. So one day 
I'm trying to put Mariana to bed and her sister, and they are taking her, they're like their sweet time. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They are taking forever to do everything. Hey, Mariana, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. So I'm about to like brush her teeth, and she looks at me and she says, hmm, Tata, what's a negative? Tata's what she called me. She says, Tata, what's a negative number? Now, I know for sure she hasn't learned about negative numbers in school. So now I stop. And like I did, I feel what any math teacher that would have done, right? So I go downstairs, I get some graph paper, I go upstairs, I do a number line, I say, here's zero, here is one, two, three, like these are the numbers that you know. I said the negative numbers are on the other side. So I say negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. And then my daughter is looking at the number line. She looks at me and she says, hmm, so negative numbers are like Anakin. They're on the dark side. And I said, yes. That is exactly what they are. So then I'm running back downstairs. My, my wife is like, what's going on? What are you doing? I, I told you to put them to bed. I said, like, this is important. We got to take care of this. So we go downstairs. We're big fans of Star Wars. Who doesn't like Star Wars? So I get the Lego pieces that we have. We go upstairs. We put Anakin as the chosen one. And then we put Darth Vader as negative one. And then we keep thinking about it. And she said, like, well, Master Yoda is pretty strong. Like, I feel that he will be, like, all the way to the right on the, on the number line. And then we put Palpatine all the way to the left. We also use the little lightsabers to show positive and negative. So long story short, she got, like, 30 extra minutes of being awake. But it was like such like a natural connection. Like in her mind, she probably just said like, what's a negative number? So I will like talk about it. And like she wouldn't have to go to bed right away. But it was just like in her brain, right? I think she was like first grade at the time. She said, oh, like negative numbers are like on the negative side. They're like on the dark side, like Anakin. And it was just such a beautiful connection. All right. So at this point, I've tried like for like, I don't know, two, three years, four years. I've tried math play with my daughter at home. And here's what I learned. I learned that effective math play always have a component of curiosity, right? There is something that we're exploring. There is something that we're trying to find out. There is a question that she has that she's trying to like learn. Like we, and I always pretended that I didn't know. It's there. So there is a curiosity. There's something that we want to find out. There is an exploration. And the most important thing is that it has to be student driven. The times where Miranda was the most engaged is when we were exploring something that she wanted to do. Now, I always had a plan, right? I would come downstairs and say, all right, so today we're going to do addition or we're going to explore like this shapes. And then she will ask me a question and I kind of like will adapt and I say, all right, let's just explore that question. So it was extremely effective. And then she started like doing things in school and she was like, oh, Tata, today we were doing this. And I was able to like help my friends and I knew what they were talking about. So it created not only like this love and like this passion for mathematics, that it's fun, that we could do math play, to the point that she will say like sometimes, you saw like, I was like, Miranda, let's go downstairs to the basement. And she will say, okay, hold on, wait, are we gonna do play or are we gonna do math play? Because those are different. Um, so it, it, it was just fun. And so as a secondary teacher, I started to wonder, right? Now my teacher, Brendan, is like, oh my God, she's always engaged. It feels like we're playing a game. She's doing beautiful mathematical connections to like concepts that sometimes she's ready to learn and sometimes she'll be learning in, in future years. So I started to wonder, I said, hmm, is this, can this work with my students at the high school level? Can this work with my students at the college level? Because like at home, I have one student. I have my daughter, right? And we don't have any, like, uh, there's no specific curriculum that I'm following. Now, I mentioned I'm not an elementary school teacher, so I look up, like, kind of like, hey, what is it? What do they learn in, in kindergarten? What do they learn in first grade? What are they? So, and then, like, I kind of, like, follow that, but I didn't have a specific curriculum to follow. I don't have to do a report card for her. I don't have to do a test. My uh, time periods are, like, unlimited. I mean, they're only bounded by um, bedtime. But I started to wonder, I'm like, oh my God, this is so much fun. She's always engaged. She's learning so much. She's making connections. Can I do this? Can I, can I try a math play approach with my students at the high school level? Now, I'm a teacher. I'm a classroom teacher. Like <clears throat> tomorrow, Monday, I'm going to be working with my students. I'm going to be taking attendance. I'm going to be teaching a new lesson. So I know your fears. Like I know what you're probably going to think about. I was worried. I was legitimately worried about like trying something new because you're going to hear, well, if it, if it ain't broken, why fix it, right? If you have something that is working, why try something else? Giving up control, because even though, like the math play approach with my daughter relied a lot on her, on like what she wanted to do. So giving up control felt like, oh my God, like what if this is not effective? Because like one thing is teaching a first grader, second grader at home, but now I have 20 students or 30 students in a class. 
And and the other thing that I was really worried about is a lack of student engagement. What if like, you know, high school students were too cool to do math play? So I was worried about this. I said, oh my God, like, is this going to work? What if I get in trouble? What if they don't like it? What if they think it's silly? But my heart told me that, okay, like, this is good for my daughter. And I see that is is engaging and I see that she loves it. And I see that she's making beautiful mathematical connections. So I felt I felt almost responsible. I was like, no, no you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to give it a shot with my high school students and see what happens. If it doesn't work now that it doesn't work, but I'm not going to be able to go to sleep thinking that this could be something that might work for them, make it fun for them. And I decide not to try. It. So at the time, I'm sorry, I show you, I show you that at the time, I'm just going to give you some background. I was teaching geometry, um, algebra two, pre-calculus and calculus. So I had to decide, okay, like, where do I start? So I decided that geometry, because of like all the different applications, will be like a safe place to start doing math play, right? Because again, again, I haven't tried this. I've been teaching at the time for like 13 years, 14 years. I, I have my lessons. I have everything that I need. And I haven't tried this approach. I don't know how effective it's going to be. I don't even know if it's going to be effective. But I decided to like try it. So I decided to start a math play with my geometry students. So I, this was like early during the school year. So we were do, exploring right triangles. So this is what I decided to do with like, like now looking back, I feel like geometry was the right place to start, but it was kind of risky. So I told my students, all right, we're exploring right triangles. I told them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go outside and take a picture of something that you think is a right triangle. Then we're going to come back and then we're going to prove or disprove that it's actually a right triangle. Now my students are looking at me like, what? And I said, let's go outside. Let's go outside. Take a picture of something you think is a triangle, uh, a right triangle, come back, and then we'll prove it. So my students went outside, took all kinds of pictures. Now, when they left, I was afraid. I was like, oh, my God, what if they don't come back? What if administration comes in? Like, what, you, what are you doing? Why are they walking away? So about five minutes after, they start to come in. And I'm like, oh, my God, thank God. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. They're coming back. So they come back, and then they start showing each other. I think this is the right triangle. I think this is the right triangle. And then what I had them do is I told them, so now I want you to take that picture, the picture that you took, upload it to GeoGebra, and let's actually prove that it's a right triangle. Now, I didn't tell them how. At that point, we had done like Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals B squared, but there were other things that they knew. So I said, like, put it on GeoGebra and prove or disprove that it's actually a right triangle. So some students went into, okay, I'm going to do Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This picture of this student, you can see that they use slope. So they use slope to show that they, they wanted to see the negative reciprocals of the slope. Um, some students did Pythagorean theorem. Some students used GeoGebra to measure the angles. So they started making all these connections about right triangles that I honestly didn't anticipate. And also, like, I could have given them, like, a worksheet, right? Nothing will be worksheets. I grew up doing worksheets where they do like kind of like multiple examples. But here they were doing one example. But it was so meaningful because they were making so many different connections. They knew, oh, I could do Pythagorean theorem. Mr. Valencia, is it okay if I do the slopes? And I said, well, your goal is to show that is a right triangle. Do what you think is best. So I started seeing that they were engaged. They liked it. And they like they were buying into it. So I said, all right, let's try it again. So later that year, we were doing parallelograms. So then I told them, all right, so now I want you to go around the school. Like, don't go outside. Go around the school and find a parallelogram. And then prove, disprove that it's actually a parallelogram. Now they knew what to do. They got out and they were coming back and showing each other's pictures. Like, oh, look at the one that I got. And it, they were so engaged. It was, it was, there was, a, the level of engagement was like, uh, like, like I've never seen before. So they liked the activity. And so at this point, to myself, all right, so math play can definitely work at the secondary level as well. So then I decided, all right, so now I got a geometry. I'm like, in my mind, geometry check. Let's go into pre -count. So one day I'm going through my like Twitter and, and my Twitter account. And I'm like scrolling down and I see the Pringles wrinkles. So at the time it was new to me. I was like, oh, this is so cool. So I couldn't help to notice that they're going to make a circle, right? And at this time we were doing uh, conic sections with my pre students. So I said, oh, Let's get some Pringles and let's have them build the circle in, in class. So I decided to do that. And it was just as fun. I've tried this activity both like in the classroom when we were remote because of COVID. We did it like remotely and it was well. The only thing that I would recommend is always have extras. So like the big can will make an entire circle. 
but high school students will eat them, right? So I always had extra. So they, they came to class. Their goal was to like make the circle. Now, after they make the circle, because like, I don't want people to feel or think, oh, like math play is kind of cute. If I have time, I do it. It's not rigorous enough. So after they build the circle, then I say, all right, now let's take a picture of that circle and like kind of do like a line of best fit. I want you to write the equation that best fits your circle. And like this lesson, like so many things happen because like some students circle kind of looking like an ellipse. So they were like, oh, Mr. Valencia, like I got this circle, but the like it doesn't really fit. Like, or it doesn't fit as well. And that like not led into like our next conic section. So I was able to do it in pre-college. It worked. The students were engaged. They were happy. They had to collaborate together. They they started like building the base and it has to be like a thicker base. There are, I mean, if you Google the Pringles Ringo challenge, you'll see it. There are YouTube video tutorials, but like that, just be able to do it. My classes are like uh, 40, 50 minutes long. So you were within a class period. So in my mind, geometry check, pre-calc check. Now let's go into calc because I'm thinking to myself, I could do the calc, uh, whatever I come up with in calc, I could do it at the high school level and I could also do it at the college level with my students. So we were doing an, our optimization unit. If you haven't taken calc, don't worry. This is easy. They have like a flat surface, a flat rectangular surface. So it's like a classical problem. They want to cut off the corners and build um, a box that has the, the greatest possible volume. So we did the problem in class and whatnot. And then the next day they're coming in. As they're coming in, I'm giving them a piece of paper, like printed paper. So they like get the paper and like, what is this for, Mr. Valencia? So then I tell them, all right, so now let's apply the knowledge that you learned yesterday. I want you to now actually create a box. So in class, my students they decided to create. Now, before they created the box, I showed them this applet, like the best applet ever if you're doing optimization that shows the relation of like, what happens when you cut out the corners? What is the relation to the volume? And what happens like when the, the slope of the tangent line is zero? That is the maximum. So they were able to see like everything that was happening in one applet. And then after they did this, boom, they build the box. Now, after they build the box, I just I told them, you know what? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to decorate your box. I want you to make it yours. And it was just such a fun activity. I get like this class was a class of juniors. So a lot of times what ends up happening is one day become seniors they come back and ask me, mr valencia can you write my college reg letter so when i wrote the the when i write the college reg letter students a lot of times i ask like what's one thing that you remember from the class or like what are you showing just to help me like um guide my what i'm going to write and a lot of them share like oh i remember the day we did the, the the boxes i remember like they mentioned this math play activities because i feel that how they felt when they were doing um, the activity has an impact. Like they take that with them. They're learning the mathematics. You can see it's as rigorous as any problem that you will do, but then they're making all these connections and they're kind of like making it their own. So at this point, geometry check, pre-calc check, and cal check. So I'm like, all right, math play is working. Now here's what I noticed with my students at the high school level. I noticed very, very high levels of engagement. Oh, I should mention that at the high school where I teach, I teach what you will consider like the honors, like the honors level, the standard level, and sort of like the essential level. I try my math play activities at all levels, experiences very similar results. Now, the scaffolds might be different, but the giving students a chance to math play is something that you could do with any learners. So I notice high levels of engagement. I notice also like a level of perseverance. Like when things weren't working out, they would like look at another group and oh, how did you guys get this to work? They became like the tech support of each other. And there was also like a sense of ownership over the material that they were learning because they were creating something. All right, so at this point, my wife always tells me when you talk about math play, you talk too fast. So I apologize. At this point, I want to pause and I want to give you a chance to tell me what questions do you have at this point. I'm going to check the chat so you can throw them in the chat. Tell me what questions do you have. And notice, I'm saying what questions do you have? I'm not saying do you have any questions. You should always ask your students what questions do you have. All right, so what questions do you have? Let me see. I'm checking this out. Put them on the chat. Diaz, love, love your passion. Can you? Oh, I will definitely share my PowerPoint. I'll share it on Twitter. I'll put it on my website. Pushback from parents. Awesome. So, 
it turns out that like all the activities, actually, the parents were, were happy because this will come home and like are sharing about their activities. Uh, you're not going to believe this, but kids will like start sharing on their social media. So how do I find activities? So to be honest, it just like there are I've been teaching for 16 years. So like in all the classes, like I usually know, OK, like I like I know that we're doing right triangles and then like I know the next topic. So a lot of times, to be honest, I find things on Twitter. I see something that, oh, like this could be an activity that could be great for like whatever. I also feel that students at the elementary level, my elementary school experience was back in Colombia. So like now I see it through my daughter. Like I see that they get to play a lot. So a lot of times I see something that my daughter is doing and then I try to like implement it or facilitate it with my students at the high school level. Okay, yes, I have suggestions. I'm, I'm seeing questions about what text tools do I use? I use... All the texts that, that are, I use, uh, GeoGebra, I use the Math Learning Center, I use Desmos. I'm going to be sharing some of these, yes. Uh, play for long division. Oh, my goodness, this is so much fun. So, yes, I do have some uh, activities and suggestions. So, also, the other thing that I will recommend is always start in a place where you're comfortable. So, like, if you have been teaching geometry for a long time, that's where you want to start. Don't start in a class that that you like this is the first time that you're teaching it. Always like collaborate with people. So the activities I find I try to find a lot of inspiration on Twitter and also like playing actually playing with my daughters. When I play with my daughters, I usually get ideas of like, oh my God, like I like the functions, right? Like I do it like sometimes it goes both ways. I do something with my daughter that I want to apply to my high school students. Sometimes I do something at the high school that I'm like, oh my goodness, I think I could do this with my daughter. All right, so I'm going to give you more ideas. So I'll, I will be sharing the presentation on my Twitter. I'll put it on my on my website, and you'll have access to it. And I have more resources for you. All right. So at this point, I'm thinking, oh, my God, like this is, this is amazing. Like they like it. They're engaged. Everyone likes it. So now it's time for Math Play 2.0. And this is good because now I know that it works. So I need to, like, step it up. So at the, at the time, my students were learning, uh, my pre-cal students, we're learning about polar coordinates. So I know we, like if you thought pre-cal, you know exactly what happens, right? They're so used to working in a rectangle, moving on the x-axis and moving in the y-axis. But now we have to move in a circle, right? Because now we're doing polar coordinates. You have to know like which circle and then which angle. So I decided to play a, a game of Battleship using polar coordinates. And this was so much fun. So I went on GeoGebra and I found this Battleship uh, applet where students have to like hit a target. So they have to adjust the angle, they have to adjust the distance. So right now, this is on degrees, but this applet is also available in radians. So what I had my students, so I show the students my mini lesson, and then after I do the mini lesson, I said, all right, so now we're gonna do the practice. The practice is actually gonna be a game. You're gonna play each other. So then I students got a partner and they started playing with each other. So the goal was, for them to hit like 10 targets. And then you could see like, this was not my idea, but students started saying like, oh, Mr. Valencia, can we time each other to see who hits 10 targets uh, faster? I was like, all right, you wanna be competitive, go ahead. So at the end of the lesson, like sometimes I get feedback like, oh, but like, how is that different from a worksheet, right? So the mathematics is not different, but the way the students engage with it is 100% different. Cause now they're like, they, they wanna beat each other. They're, they're doing the same mathematics in the context of a game, they're trying to beat each other. So this was a winner. It was, uh, and if you Google Battleship in GeoGebra, you'll see this applet. Uh, this was, um, I didn't make it, so I'm giving credit to the person where I found it, but this was a winner. All right, another activity that was good. I was teaching, I do, I do a STEM program at Mercy College. By the way, it's now called Mercy University. Um, and my students were learning about triangles. These are high school students that's like an enrichment program at the college level. So we learned how to classify triangles. And as I was driving in into Mercy College, I saw these like statues that they have that all in the shapes of triangles. So like that immediately, I was like, oh, I am teaching triangles. There are triangles over there. We're about to go and classify those triangles. So after the lesson, I said, all right, guys, class trip. Let's go to the front of the, of the college. So I walked my students. I didn't tell anybody. I walked my students all the way to the front. And then we measured the we measured them, we measure angles, and then we were able to classify them. And then we walk back, 
No one knew, so it was good. Um, so, but if you're going to do something like this, make sure that your administrators are okay with it. I wanted to do it because I feel that a lot of times if you start thinking about like, should I do this and asking people, uh, a lot of people are going to give you reasons. Okay. A lot of people are going to give you reasons of why you shouldn't do it. So instead I want to do it. <laughs> and then like, it was good. My students loved it. They were like, oh, we actually got to classify it. They were like telling each other. So activities like this. So where do I find like, my my um inspiration sometimes like that is just around us all right now i gotta tell you about the next project so the next project that i do with my students at the high school level was i wanted to do a desmos art project so we are done with let me give you the context so we're done with conic sections they know about circles parabolas hyperbolas they know about everything and so i want what i wanted them to do was build something right uh, using the all the knowledge that you have of conic sections. And what I decided to do is like try to keep it very flexible. So I didn't want to give them a lot of instructions. I said your project should include at least eight different types of functions. Now, it could be the ones that we just studied or it could be ones that you know from before, like exponential logs. You are not limited to how many equations you do. And I told them, so I, in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, like what could go wrong? Why did they just go? and copy something and give it to me because that's not the point, right? And I asked them, you know, to submit the pictures, submit the Desmos link and whatnot. So here is what I decided to do. Now, I work at Horace Greeley uh, High School in Chappaqua, New York. This is the lower school, and this is a picture of Horace Greeley himself. So what I decided to do, I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I know there's a lot of, like, Desmos projects out there. I want you to make a Desmos project around our spirit. And then... It was on the stuff the students came up with really, really surpassed like any like anything that I could think that they were going to do. It was amazing. So they started doing amazing things. They started writing like 50 equations, 60 equations, even though if you look at the directions. It just says, like, make sure you have at least eight. So they they had fun with this. Um, I feel pretty comfortable and familiar using the, the using Desmos. But they asked me questions that I didn't know. They're like, Mr. Valencia, how do I restrict the domain? Or how do I just restrict the range? So what ended up happening was that like there was only one Mr. Valencia and about like, I don't know, 20-something students. So students started to like help one another. Another thing that was like so beautiful is like during the lesson, a student says, oh, Mr. Valencia, I want to shade in the circle. I, I have the circle. I want to shade it in so it actually looks like our school logo. So we're the thing. I'm like, mm, I think you could do that. I'm not sure how. And then another student in the room says, oh, why don't you why don't you just use an inequality instead of an equal sign? And I was like, oh, my God, let's try that. So we tried that and it worked. So I don't want you to feel that, oh, my God, I'm not comfortable with all these technologies. It's OK. The best tech support that you could have is your students. Your students will help one another. And also, like, it also models the growth mindset that we always talk about. Like, I'm showing my students, like, I'm not a hunt. Like, I don't have all the answers for this tool, but I'm willing to try Let's learn together. Let's figure it out. So the things that they come up with, like they started doing things from like the baseball team, the volleyball team, and it was beautiful to the point that after we finished the first project, later on, they asked for another one. They said, Mr. Valencia, can we do another project for like, do for as an extra assignment? Also, when you do something like this, don't give students a lot of instructions and also don't attach like a big grade to it. And if you are going to give a big grade, like, Try to support them a lot, like a grade for completion, because you don't want students to like to limit their thinking or limit their creativity because they're worried about the grade. So later on, they said, Mr. Valencia, can we do it? But now can we do it about like our favorite book? Or actually it was about their favorite movie, but somebody says like, I don't watch movies. I said, all right, so what do you do? And she said, I read books. I said, all right, so do your favorite book. So students did like their favorite book, their favorite movie. The, the, um, the goal was to recreate a scene, um, uh, a character from their favorite movie. And the things that I saw that they came up with were completely, completely amazing. Actually, we got to, I got to write a little blog for the Mathematical Association of America about this assignment. And I showed them. I was like, oh, look at what we did, guys. The, our school decided to put like all the many of these pictures on the school website. So they were talking about it. The, I shared it with the parents. The parents were happy. That, oh, I didn't know you could do that with math. Or I didn't know that it could be fun.
Um, that I've done this like every year now. Like this is the first time I always do it. I did it last year when the Encanto movie came out, like the Disney Encanto movie. So I know that there are projects out there. So like, what do you do? You just adjust. So this movie had just come out, like I think it was like towards like November or December. So I decided, all right, let's do a Desmond Star project in a character from the Encanto movie. So now even like there might be projects out there, but there's not going to be that many projects on a movie that just came out. So they had to like get authentic, make it, make it their own. And what I noticed is that students, when it's something that that belongs to them, I got an email from a parent saying like, Mr. Valencia, you know, like Johnny spend like a weekend doing this. And we asked him like, why are you still working on that? And he said, no, 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 I want it to be perfect. So like, it's meaningful to them. Like I didn't ask students to like, okay, give me 50 equations. It has to be this, it has to be that. But once it's something that is meaningful to them or something that they're connected with, they will put in the work. The last, um, our project that we did, or the last like uh, kind of three minutes, we did a self-portrait. Students said, Mr. Valencia, is it okay if I do a self-portrait? And I said, why not? Let's try. Let's see what you come up with. And if you, you can see in here that this student, she actually wrote 117 equations. Now, remember, the instructions were at least eight. Now she did 117 equations. She like color it. It was beautiful. And then this had a direct impact in when they took the test, right? Because I, I know you're thinking, all right, like this is cool, but like they still have to take a test. If they're able to like apply this, they're doing all the different transformations. They're doing all the different conic sections. They're doing different domain and range restrictions. They're using inequalities all together. They put it together in a nice product that they're going to give us. So at this point, like my, um, the, the Desmos project was a total winner. And I saw that students are, it, it creates, it creates this sense of like, I, I was able to come up with this. Students were sharing their projects on their social media. So like, once we get to the level, like I'm happy if they're talking about math beyond our classroom, that's good. That's what we want. Another thing that, that I noticed is after reading Thinking Classroom, so I feel like at this point, if you haven't read Thinking Classroom, I don't know what to tell you. Go buy it. Go read it. So I noticed that there were a lot of like the non-curricular tasks, and I feel that this is a safe place for uh, teachers to start. If you feel like, oh, I don't know if that's going to work with that class, start with a non-curricular task. So like, and you could adjust it. You could do this at the middle school level. And then if you notice in here, I extend the questions five, six, and six. Instead of like having the three by regular three by three, what if it's a four by four by four? What if it's a five by five by five? What if it's n by n by n? And then um the students are engaged, they jump into the problem, and they're thinking like, okay, like I don't know what's gonna happen in math class today, but I know they're gonna be meaningful. So when we did this activity, I've done this activity in the classroom, I've done it remotely, and my school at some point used a hybrid model. You have to see this. So if you look at the upper left picture, you can see that I have a student in the classroom who's working the problem on a chalkboard and she's FaceTiming her friend because of this, this was like early during, I mean, not early, like towards the middle of COVID through the first, I don't even remember, where like some of our students were in person and some students were at home. So I like, I felt that students were missing that connection. So I felt like, no, yo, you could collaborate with whoever is at home because these students were like BFFs. So she was in classroom doing the problem, but she was collaborating with the student that was at home. So using non-curricular tasks as, as a way to like start math, start a conversation is also a great, great way to engage our students. All right. So at this point, after trying uh, math play 2.0 with my students, I noticed that students will do more than required for sure. There is a sense of ownership over the material that they're learning. And it also help because they started to create community. What I learned is that other teachers will tell me like, oh, what are they doing in your class? Like they keep talking about like this project. They keep talking about Encanto. So it creates a sense of community, of a math community that goes beyond the walls of our classroom. All right. Now, I'm a as I mentioned, I'm a teacher. Tomorrow I'm going to go to the classroom, take attendance and do my lesson. So I want to be 100% honest, like, honest, full disclosure and transparent with you. Math play at this point is not something that I'm able to do every day. I want to say, yeah, uh, it's not something that I'm able to do in every topic. And it doesn't always apply. So I wish that I had a math play activity for every lesson. 
That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build map play activities for every single lesson they do. Um, it's also something that, that I'm not able to do in every topic. There are some topics that I'm like, oh my God, like this is going to be so good. And there are topics that I'm like, oh my God, how could I possibly do? Like if I'm doing implicit differentiation in Calc, how do I do math play with that, right? So like some topics are more difficult than others. Also like implicit differentiation might be easier for somebody else. So as you start to like develop your math play activities, you're going to see that some topics you're going to be like, oh my God, I'm definitely going to do this. I'm going to be, and then there are some topics that you're like, you know what? I don't know if I could try um, um, math play yet. Also, it's, it's it might not always apply. It really depends on the needs of your students. Like maybe starting with a non-curricular task could be a safe place. Maybe starting on a review day. What if your math play activity comes in the form of a review? So that way you're not thinking, oh, I don't have time to do a new lesson. The curriculum doesn't allow me. Maybe it could be the way you start a unit or maybe it could be the way you like finish or review for a test. So with that said, should you be facilitating math play? And what do you think the answer is? Well, you're talking to the Mr. Mathlay, right? So the answer is yes, absolutely. You should, we should all be facilitating math play regardless of the level. Remember, I started with my daughter in our basement uh, before pre-K and I do it with my high school students. I do it with my college students, not as much with the college students, but I try to implement it as well. And I see similar results. I see the same levels of engagement. I see that they like it, that they run with it and that it becomes it creates a sense of community within my classroom. So here's like, if you're thinking, all right, like this sounds good. Like I like this. How do I start? So what I will strongly recommend is starting a class that you're comfortable teaching. So if you've been teaching algebra for a long time, start there. If you've been teaching geometry for a long time, start there. So starting in a class where you're comfortable and what I will strongly, strongly recommend, like, and I want you to stick to it is try at least one time within every chapter or like one time within every unit of study. And you'll see that it goes by, you're going to have, okay, now I have two like math play activities for this lesson. Now a math play activity doesn't have to be a big project. It could be your activation. It could be a part of like how you explore, like when we did with the right triangles, it could be like a practice part of the lesson. It could be some sort of assessment or X ticket at the end, or like part of your consolidation where you're like putting it all together. So a math play activity doesn't have to be an entire lesson. It could be a part of the lesson. It could be how you started. And what I strongly recommend is like start doing it at least one time per unit of study. All right, so at this point, let me pause, let me get some water and tell me what questions do you have? Let me go in here. Oh my God. Uh, let me see. I see a lot of things in here. So what questions do you have? <laughs> Where can you purchase some of your energy? Well, I will recommend buy math play. <laughs> I try to put the story in there. <laughs> Oh, what are the applications? Yes. Good advice, good advice. What sort of, so the scaffolds really depend on the, the students. Uh, with my advanced, like pre students, I don't give them much. I usually just like throw them and say, okay, you need to figure this out. But um, a lot of times, maybe doing an easier version of the problem could be a good place to start. Yes, it gives us permission to put math into action. Oh, awesome, Christy. <laughs> I have shared, Richard, I have shared some of the, um, I've presented for teachers. Um <laughs> Yes, I know you will, I, Richard. I have presented for teachers, and what they the feedback that I've gotten is is positive. I actually got in trouble with your energy. <laughs> so the, for the administration, that's another thing that is important. I feel that my administration at the high school at the college has been very supportive because they let me run with it. And and then what I do is I try to be. Here's what I do. I'm gonna give you my secret. So let's say that I'm trying a math activity. You know, I don't know on Thursday. And I, it's something that I've never tried. Now, I'm nervous. I'm like, oh, my God, is this going to work? You know what I do? I invite the administrators. I tell them. I send them an email. 
to my direct supervisor and I said, like, you know what? On Thursday, I'm trying this activity for the first time. Uh, feel free to stop by. So that way, if they stop by, like I invited you and I told you it was the first time that this was going to work out. Now, there's been times where I try something and it doesn't go as planned. But even the times where it doesn't go as planned, um, it, my students are engaged. So I like encourage you to try it. Don't let, oh my God, what if this happens? Like try it and then start building upon it. Don't start with something too big or say like, okay, we're going to do this math play activity. It's going to be, I don't know, a hundred points of your grade because then it's like, it's like too much. Let me get some water. I said I was going to get water and I gave you water. Okay. Oh, I'm going to share. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody shared the link. Um, all right. So now here are some other, as I mentioned, like I get a lot of my ideas from, from Twitter, from X now. Uh, so here are some ideas that I also found helpful to start facilitating math play. So if you don't know Howie, go and follow Howie right now. Howie is, uh, he's, he's amazing. One of the things that I love that he does is the math memes. A lot of times I, I feel that math memes are applied math. Like if you have a different opinion, I'd like to discuss it with you. But I feel like, because like to understand a math meme, you have to understand the math. Otherwise it's not funny. Um, so I use math memes sometimes, like after giving a formula, for example, college students at the college level, after giving them the power rule for differentiation, I show them this meme and it just clicks. Sometimes it's like something silly, but it helps them remember. So using math memes in class and you don't even have to make your own. You could Google them. Uh, using also same but different from Dr. Lumi. This is a, an amazing uh, routine that I do all the time at all different levels. I use it with my daughter at home. I use it with my students at the high school level, at the college. And usually the idea is you're presented with two things. And how are they the same but different? It's very inviting. It's safe. There's no right or wrong answer. And it goes from like elementary, like this circle. And then this example that I have on the bottom is something that I created for my breakout students in the context of like polar coordinates. So I said like X squared plus Y squared equals 16. That's going to be a circle center at zero, zero radius four. And then R equals four in polar is also a circle with radius four. Visual pa patterns. I was just on our session uh, last night. I was last night. I think it was last night uh, for fun. Amazing, amazing session. I, this to me became very helpful in the, uh, when we were doing uh remote learning because my students will like start the lesson and I felt that they were more compliant than engaged. And that's not my style. I feel like by now you could tell. So I started like using like the visual pattern. I was like, we're going to like, here's a visual pattern. I want you to come up with step four and then bring it to closer to the camera when you are ready. So it like kind of like everyone had to do it. And it's also like a safe way to start the class and like bring in everybody. Which one does not belong? This is a classic. This is, if you haven't tried which one does not belong, I highly, highly recommend it. Now we're at the point that we create our own. Like you could tell that we like Star Wars in our house. These are ones that I've done with my daughter just to introduce the routine, right? Like, okay, like how are the, you know, which one doesn't belong? And then you could get more, more mathematical. Uh, so these are routines that I will highly, highly recommend for, um, to start a conversation about like math life. So if you like these ideas, I know I speak fast. I can't help it. I love math. I love math play. And I want everyone to do math play. So if, let's connect. I am on Twitter at Mr. Valencia 24. I have a website, LibreValencia.com. I'm also on YouTube where I've shared tutorials about tech tools that I use. I've done different talks about like uh, math play for different levels, elementary, uh, secondary tech tools that help facilitate math play. So that can be found on my website, my Twitter account. Again, at Mr. Valencia 24. And this is where, what I want to leave you with. This is the question that I want you to think about. Bring this back to your department. Bring this back to your significant other. Bring this back to your spouse. Bring, like, ask this question. What if math class was every kid's favorite class? I feel that for many of us, it was. Like, math was our jam, right? Like, what if math class was everyone's favorite class? I think that with the tools that we have, with the technology that we have, we can make that happen. So let's think about that. Consider what if math class was every kid's favorite class? And thank you so much for joining my session. Uh, feel free to reach out. You can find me at Mr. Valencia24. Uh, here is my uh, website and the book, Get, get Math Play. you get some ideas. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions.
Well, thank you so much, my friend. Uh, folks, do a huge, huge favor. Uh, Lebo, this has been a wonderful talk. Many big takeaways. I'm wondering, friends, if you haven't yet done so, share your big takeaway or maybe your action item, your next step that you plan to take now that you've experienced this particular session and these many ideas and resources. Also, if you haven't yet, take a screenshot, share those notes that you've been taking out on the web in social and tag Lebo, tag at Make Math Moments so that we can share these ideas farther and further so that more students can have that experience where as our speaker just shared, you know, maybe it just maybe more students look at math as their favorite subject instead of just a subject that has to be done and checked off the list. So thanks so much for that, my friends. Before you run off to other sessions, just a reminder that we do have upgrade tickets available to you on the Summit dashboard if you head to the tickets uh, side of things. Um, today is the last day that you can buy the one week pass. And then you will be open to upgrade to the $39 two months pass. That's definitely the ticket that people are showing is most popular. We also have our email getting flooded with people looking to upgrade their $29 ticket to a two month ticket. So if that's you, feel free to email us. We will send you some details on how you can do that um, with a special code. So for those people who haven't upgraded yet, definitely worth looking at. Replays are open until the end of the day. Of course, gobble up as many as you can right now, but let's be honest, we know how this goes, right? We can cram all weekend long. It's going to be hard to put all of these ideas into action tomorrow. That's unrealistic. So spreading it out over time is probably the better move anyway. So taking a little extra time to be able to come back to some of these ideas, to revisit, to make yourself a plan and actually implement is probably a solid, smart move. If you're a district leader and you're looking for how you can get a site license, a school-wide license, a district-wide license, we have some amazing opportunities for those. Reach out to us, let us know, and we'll do our best to craft something that uh, will stretch your PD dollar as far as you can to get the most benefit for as many educators as you can. If you're looking for certificates tomorrow, for those who have a free ticket, you will get more information around your certificates. You'll have a link and uh, all the details that you need in an email coming your way. So check that spam folder, make sure that you're, you're safe listing our email address and make sure that you keep an eye for that. If you haven't yet, we've got a podcast friends every single week, over 250 episodes uh, and over 1.5 million listens since the inception of the podcast, uh, head on over to your favorite platform on Apple, on Spotify, on YouTube, wherever you consume your pro podcast content, hit follow and do us a huge favor. Leave us a quick rating and review, and that will help us reach a wider audience. Lebo, I want to thank you again on behalf of John and myself. I'm Kyle Pierce. And we are having such a blast learning and sharing to try to strengthen our math education community. And we want to thank you for uh, making that even easier for those educators who are with us here today. So thanks a lot, my friend. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Take care, everybody. Have a great day and uh, head into those next sessions. Refresh your dashboard.